Welcome to the Good Old Days of Radio Show. It's Tuesday, time for drama, variety, and comedy. And in this case, it's just going to be a classic story, classic movie, classic everything. You're going to hear something a, a little bit different and unique. This is the Maxwell House Good News Program from June 29th, 1939, sponsored by Maxwell House Coffee. Now, the special show for today is The Wizard of Oz, starring Judy Garland and a whole lot of the original cast. And this was done uh, right around the time of the film. We'll check that out and let you know at the end whether, when exactly the film came out. But it's, it's 1939, so it's around that same time. Uh, MGM actually was the official owner of the Good News program produced by MGM Studios and sponsored by Maxwell House Coffee. And they used the program as a way to promote their films as they were coming out. And this is a particularly great one. So for those of you who are familiar with The Wizard of Oz, this is a little bit different than the film, but not much. And you'll, you'll really like it. And it has Judy Garland and a whole bunch of other great people. So here we go with Maxwell House Coffee Time, Good News of 1939, The Wizard of Oz. Maxwell House Coffee presents this season's final edition of Good News of 1939. The makers of Maxwell Coffee welcome you to an hour of entertainment brought to you by the Metro Golden Mayor Studios in Hollywood with a special list of guest stars from the cast of The Wizard of Oz Judy Garland, Bert Lahr, and Ray Bolger, E.Y. Harburg, Harold Allen, plus the regular Good News gang, Frank Morgan, Fanny Bryce and Hanley Stafford, and Meredith Wilson and his orchestra. And here is your host for this evening, Robert Young. <laughs> Good evening, folks. Although this is the closing program of this season's Good News series, this is not going to be a sad party. No, sir. We're going to try to give you something to remember us by. We're going to introduce for the first time some of the loveliest music you've ever heard. We're going to present the exciting personalities for whom this music was written. In short, we're dedicating our entire program to MGM's newest screen achievement, The Wizard of Oz. As most everybody knows by now, The Wizard of Oz stars Judy Garland, Frank Morgan, Ray Bolger, Burt Lahr, Jack Haley, Billy Burke, and Margaret Hamilton, and was directed by Victor Fleming. And now heard for the first time on the air, an overture of the songs from The Wizard of Oz written by E.Y. Harburg and Harold Arlen, played for us by Meredith, the Wilson of Oz. <laughs> Oh, my. 
star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Where troubles melt like lemon drops away above the chimney top. That's where you'll find me. Thank you. Meredith, I've heard you and your orchestra play many an overture, but none more thrilling than this one. Oh, shucks, Bob. It weren't nothing. <laughs> All I can say about the Wizard of Oz music is that it's so unusual and so lovely that it's a real thrill to play it. You know, Bob, I can hardly wait to see the Wizard of Oz. It's my favorite story. Mine, too. Well, I'll never forget the first time the story was told to me. It was thrilling. My uh, school teacher held me on her lap. Oh, to be 18 again. That was Meredith Wilson, the oomph boy. <laughs> While Meredith lives among his memories of happy school days, suppose we continue with our study of child life. Here she is, that little decoy for a nervous breakdown, Fanny Bryce as Baby Snooks. <laughs> Last week, Daddy, played by Hanley Stafford, became the proud father of a lovely boy. Naturally, he's all wrapped up in the little one, but Snooks seems to feel that the newcomer has usurped her place in Daddy's affections. She's been acting strangely all week, and as the scene opens, Daddy is putting Snooks to bed. Here they are. All right, dear. Now say your prayers, and I'll turn out the light. I'm going to say no prayers. Oh, but Snooks, you must say your prayers. Can I leave out the baby? Why, of course not. Then I ain't going to say no prayers. <laughs> now look here, child. You don't know how you're hurting me by acting this way. I can't understand why you've been so sullen since the baby came. I don't like him. Well, why not? He hollers too much. Why, of course he cries a lot, but that's only his way of letting us know that he wants something. Well, why don't he ask for it? Oh, Snooks, you know as well as I do that infants can't talk. Why? Because no baby talks until it's at least a year old. 
That ain't what you said to Uncle Louie. What did I say to Uncle Louie? You said you cursed the day you was born. Well, never mind that. <laughs> now, I want you to say your prayer. There he goes again, Daddy. Well, Mummy will look after him. Little Dickens is probably hungry. Where did he come from, Daddy? I told you, the angels in heaven sent him down. Why? Oh, they had their reasons. I guess they couldn't stand that racket. <laughs> I wish you'd stop that silly talk. The child is adorable, and you'll soon get to love him. Don't you think he's awful cute to look at? No. Well, why do you say that? He looks like a lobster. <laughs> Well, he is a little red, but all new babies look that way. Anyway, the redness will soon disappear. Will the baby disappear? <laughs> Not if I can help it. Oh. Uh, Daddy. What is it? Is only babies' faces red? Oh, no. Sometimes grown people's faces get red. Why? Oh, well, for various reasons. Mostly a person's face turns red when, when he's ashamed. Does it? Yes. Why does Uncle Looney, Uncle Louie only get ashamed in his nose? Well, we won't discuss that now. It's time for you to go to sleep. Now, kiss me good. Snooks, what are you doing? I'm doing nothing, Daddy. You're biting your nails. I told you I don't like that habit. Why? Because it's not nice. Now, you stop it, you hear me? I don't want to. Oh, maybe you'd like a spanking. You hate me, don't you, Daddy? Oh, what are you talking about? If I bite my nails, you spank. Well, what about it? But if that new kid sticks his whole foot in his mouth, you think it's cute. <laughs> oh, what ridiculous nonsense. <laughs> now, just listen, Snooks. You've simply got to get over this jealousy. I ain't jealous. Yes, you are. No, I ain't. You are! <laughs> what are you crying about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, all right, now. Be a good little girl and go to sleep, and Daddy will always love you. All right, Daddy. Good night. Good night. Daddy? Yes? Why are you all dressed up? Well, I've been invited over to the MGM studios to see a picture. What picture? It's a private showing of The Wizard of Oz. I've got to leave right away. I want to go with you. Well, you can go with me, Snooks. <laughs> but if you promise not to interrupt, I'll tell you the story very quickly. I promise, Daddy. Very well. Once upon a time, there was a little girl who lived in Kansas, and her name was Dorothy. She lived with her... Who uh, lived? Dorothy. She lived Dorothy with her... Dorothy who? Just Dorothy. And she lived with her aunt and her uncle. <laughs> uncle Louie? No, Uncle Henry. Her aunt's name was Em, and her uncle's name was Henry, and she lived with them. Now, she was just a little... Who was? The little girl. Which little girl? The little girl in the story! What story? The Wizard of Oz! Uh... Now, don't ask any more questions. I'll be late for the picture. Now, this little girl, Dorothy, lived with her aunt and her uncle. Why? Because her parents died when she was a child and left her an orphan. What did she do with it? What did she do with what? The orphan. She was the orphan. Who was? Dorothy! Oh. Dorothy loved her uncle very much because he gave her a dog called Toto. He was black all over. Her uncle was black? No, her dog. One day there came a big cyclone and Aunt Em... Oh, what's a cyclone, Daddy? Oh, you know what a cyclone is, Snooks. What is it that comes very suddenly turns a whole house upside down and leaves nothing but trouble in its wake. A new baby. <laughs> ah, no. It's a big windstorm. Now, when the cyclone struck, Dorothy didn't have time to get to the cellar. So she was swept away in the house with Toto. And she was carried... Who was carried? Dorothy. She was carried... Oh, where's the wizard? I'm coming to him if you'll just be patient. She was carried to the land of the munchkins. What munchkins? They're very little people. Am I a little munchkin? No, no. Well, I'm little, ain't I? Listen, you can be little without being a munchkin. But you can't be a munchkin without being little. Why? Because munchkins are born little and they stay little. Children are born little and they grow up to be big. Big munchkins? No, big people. <laughs> will I grow up to be big? Certainly will. Big again, Sophie? Yes! <laughs> what are you yelling about? I want to be a munchkin. Oh, for heaven's sake. I've got to get to the studio. Will you keep quiet until I finish the story so you can go to sleep? No. Oh, you don't want to hear the end of the story? No. Well, that's fine. You want to go right to sleep? No. You don't want to hear the end of the story and you don't want to go to sleep? In heaven's name, what do you want? I want to go see the picture. Oh, well. With the
with a new baby and everything, you have had a tough week. Now, get dressed. I'm going to take you with me. Why? Oh, just on account of the new baby. Oh. Daddy? Yes? Have another baby next week so I can go to the circus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll order it right away. Come on. We're yeah, off to see, see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of mine. Now, friends, let's go back 50 years to a famous old hotel in Nashville, Tennessee. It's a warm summer night, but the stately Maxwell House is lighted with a blaze of candles. The southern aristocracy is gathered to pay honor to a great southern colonel. He stands resplendent in his uniform, surrounded by delighted, laughing girls, admiring men. And now the waiters come around with refreshments. We hear the colonel. And is this that famous Maxwell House coffee I've heard so much about? Uh, yes, sir, Colonel, this show is it. Uh, this here is Mr. Cheek's coffee. Well, I'd like to speak to Mr. Cheek if he's here. Uh, here I am, sir, at your service. Well, Mr. Cheek, I want to congratulate you. Your coffee has become very famous in the South. It's delightful. But tonight, it's so warm and all, I, I wonder if I could try your Maxwell House ice. With pleasure, Colonel. I'd thought of that, and I have the ice right here. So, there you are, sir. Thank you, Mr. Cheek. Ah, delicious. By Jove, Mr. Cheek, that is wonderful coffee. <laughs> and it's a real test when you drink coffee iced, you know. Yes, friends, either iced or hot, Maxwell House has always been a delicious coffee. But today, that famous Maxwell House is even more delicious than it was when Joel Cheek created it more than 50 years ago. And there are two important reasons why. Today, not only has this famous blend been still more marvelously enriched, but we've developed a remarkable new way of roasting Maxwell House called Radiant Roast, a process which roasts each coffee bean evenly all the way through. So there's no chance of weak coffee due to under-roasting, no chance of bitter coffee due to parching. Your new Maxwell House gives you the same rich, smooth, full-flavored goodness every time. That's why more people are enjoying Maxwell House today than ever before in its history. So, friends, get a pound of the new Maxwell House tomorrow. Try it. Your very first delicious taste will tell you that this new Maxwell House is now, more than ever, good to the last drop. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take you behind the scenes and show you how a picture was created. Early in 1938, MGM selected Mervyn Leroy to produce The Wizard of Oz. The screen adaptation having been completed, the momentous task of casting the players for each of the many important parts was attacked. The role of the Scarecrow had been assigned to Ray Bolger. The clattering, squeaking Tin Woodman was Jack Haley. The blustering, whimpering, cowardly lion was Bert Lahr. Glinda the beautiful fairy queen, Billy Burt. But what of the wizard himself? Who was humorous enough, clever enough, and foolish enough to play the wizard. And equally important, what of Dorothy, a sweet little girl who journeys to the land of Oz? Not only must she be a fine actress, but she must be a great singer. And so, in June 1938, in the office of producer Leroy... May I come in, Mr. Leroy? Judy, I'll say you may come in. I just called you at your house. Your mother said you're on your way to the studio. Oh, I just couldn't stay home. I was so nervous. Nervous? Why should you be nervous, Judy? Well, after all, Mr. Leroy, I was thinking maybe I'm not good enough for the part. And... Well, Judy, even a smart little girl like you can be wrong. We've just seen the test we made of you for the part, and... You mean I'm... Well, you've guessed it. You're Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Oh, Mr. Leroy, it can't be true. I, I dreamed and hoped for a chance like this, but I never really thought I'd be so lucky. Well, you're not lucky. We're the lucky ones. Oh, but, Mr. Leroy, I just can't believe it. But if I do wake up and it's all true, I, I promise I'll work and study and, and do anything to make good. Spoken like the real trooper that you are, Judy. <laughs> well, I think I better go now. I mean, do you mind, will you excuse me, if I run home and tell my mother the news? She'll be so thrilled. Run along, Judy, and best of luck. Oh, I'm so happy. I, well, all I can think of is thank you, Mr. Leroy. Thank you, Judy. I mean, Dorothy. <laughs> And so Judy Garland was selected to play the lovable Dorothy, the little girl who travels to the land of Oz and once there, despite its beauty, 
longs to return to the most desirable place on earth, home. Now Metro had one more casting problem. Who could play the Wizard of Oz, that lovable humbug, that man with a power complex, in short, that delightful phony. The scene, the casting office on the MGM lot. I remember it well because on that particular day I happened to drop in to see Fred Dadig myself. Hello, casting office. Who? Oh, Ed Sullivan. No, they haven't decided who will play the wizard. We'll call you. Goodbye. Good morning, Mr. Young. Hello, Marcella. Say, why is the office so crowded? I haven't seen so many men packed into one room since I visited the SS Rex. Well, there's a call out today for the Wizard of Oz. They need someone to play the title role. Oh, I see. The boss has interviewed hundreds for the part in the last two months. He... Wait a second. Here he is now. Hello, Bob. Hello, Fred. Well, we've got a wizard at last. You have a wizard. Tell us about it. Gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for coming today. The studio has made a definite decision. The part of the Wizard of Oz has been given to Frank Morgan. I demand a recount. Why, well, I'm a better actor than he is any day. The idea of giving a juicy part like that to such an incompetent loafer. Frank Morgan? Why, that's me. <laughs> And so the casting of The Wizard of Oz is complete. Then comes the news that rehearsals are to start. For this picture, unlike other pictures, required months of extensive rehearsals before even a foot of film was shot. The scene, a rehearsal stage where the director has been working with the cowardly lion, played by Bert Lahr. <laughs> well, who's a cowardly lion? Why, well, I can lick anybody half my size. The bigger they are, the harder I fall. No, no, Bert. I don't think that your mood conveys enough courage. Now, remember, you're a braggart. I gotcha, I gotcha. Why, I'll tear apart the toughest lion in town. I'll lick my weight in lionese potatoes. Come on, put them up, put them up. Ah, oh, run away, eh? I'll show you. There, take that. How do you like that guy? Knocked himself out again. <laughs> And The Wizard of Oz, being motorization of the book, was to be an enchanting musical operetta. And so E.Y. Harburg and Harold Arlen were assigned the task of writing the music and lyrics. For long weeks, Harburg and Arlen worked until the day that their score was completed. And then, in the penthouse overlooking the studio lot where the composers lived with their piano. Hello, Mr. Harburg. Hello, Mr. Arlen. Hello, Judy. We've been waiting for you. Judy, we've just finished writing one of the songs you're to sing in The Wizard of Oz. And no one's heard it yet. So we've got our fingers crossed. Oh, I can hardly wait. Will you play it now? Just sit you here, Judy. Lend us your ears. You actually mean I I'm going to be the first one to hear this? That's right. But I hope you're not the last one that's going to hear it. Now, this song is the theme of the entire picture. You're the little girl in Kansas. That unhappy little girl who's always yearning to be somewhere else but home. Oh, but I like my home. We don't mean your home in Bel Air, Judy. We mean the home in the picture. Oh, you mean, you mean I'm, I'm always trying to escape from myself. Mm-hmm. That's it, Judy. And we try to express that yearning, the yearning of all little girls in this song. Sing it, Harold. <laughs> Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I heard of once in a lullaby. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are The dreams that you dare to dream really do come to Oh, Mr. Arlen, Mr. Harper, that's beautiful. I can hardly wait to learn it. Will you teach it to me, please, now? <laughs> I heard of 
once in a lullaby. And on another rehearsal stage, Bobby Connolly, ace director of dancers, is rehearsing 150 of the world's smallest people who play the part of the fantastic munchkins in Munchkinland. All right now, everybody on the mark. Let's make this rehearsal a good one. Now remember, as you dance, you've got to sing. And you're happy because the wicked old witch of the East is no more. Ready. Ding dong, witch is dead. Witch, oh, witch, the wicked witch. Ding dong, the wicked witch is dead. Wake up, sleepy head. And so it went. Weeks and weeks of rehearsal. Then months and months of work. Work in which over 7,000 people all took a hand. Until finally that certain night came. The night when Mervyn Leroy was to take the first complete print of the picture out for a sneak preview to get the audience reaction. Well, let's get going, James. Yes, sir. Is the film in the car? Yes, sir. And here we go. Say, say, Mr. Leroy, before I drive you to this sneak preview, there's something I'd like to ask you. Well, if it's important. Well, it's kind of important, sir. Where are we going? <laughs> Well, I guess you've got a right to know since you're driving. Head for Santa Barbara. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been managing this theater for many years. And hundreds of important films have been previewed here. But tonight we present a sneak preview of a picture I know everybody's been waiting to see. For the first time on the screen of any theater... MGM's Technicolor production of The Wizard of Oz. And then for almost two hours, 2,000 people, young and old, sat in that theater in rapt attention as the Wizard of Oz unrolled before them on the screen in all the glory of its beautiful Technicolor production. When it was over, the cheers and applause of the audience were deafening. The Wizard of Oz will be released to theaters throughout the country on August 25th, and I know you'll all want to see it when it plays your favorite theater. Now, in just a few moments, all of you will become guests at the big studio party, which is being held this evening in honor of the Wizard of Oz cast, where you Maxwell House friends will hear, for the first time on the air, a special preview of music and meet the famous characters in The Wizard of Oz. Bert Lahr, Ray Bolger, Judy Garland, Fred Stone, and many others. But first, it's time for our regular Thursday evening custom. Oh, boy, Bob, look. I see tall, frosty glasses of iced Maxwell House coming. Oh, That's boy. right, Marinus. It's time once more for our familiar Thursday evening custom. A refreshing moment with Maxwell House coffee. And friends, we hope you're joining us in your homes tonight because we want to make a very special toast. You know, yesterday at 3 o'clock, 22 lucky people took off from Port Washington in the Dixie Clipper. Their destination? Europe. An historic flight, the first passenger airplane service across the North Atlantic. We salute those passengers who by now are in Lisbon, Portugal. And we're proud to tell you that among the other comforts Pan American Airways provided was a perfect cup of coffee. For Maxwell House was served exclusively on the Clipper. Tonight, let's raise our glasses high to that successful trip a trip which, which marks a new epoch in world transportation. Let's toast it with a new Maxwell House coffee, the coffee that sets a new high in coffee drinkers' pleasure. Is everybody served? Now, Meredith, let's have the music. We pause briefly for station identification. KFI Los Angeles. Okay, we're halfway through. They just took their station break. I can explain a few things that uh, you may or may not know. Okay, first of all, the movie had not yet premiered. They said it on the show. It premieres on August 25th, and this show was done June 29th. So we're actually almost two months before the film actually premiered do we get this big preview from MGM. The host at the beginning was uh, Robert Young, most famous in the 50s as Father and Father Knows Best, and then in the 70s, I guess, as Marcus Welby, whenever Marcus Welby was on. Um, a famous show in the 70s. Um, Meredith Wilson, 
the musical director on this show. Meredith Wilson is most famous for the musical The Music Man, but he had a long, long career before that, even working with Charlie Chaplin on the score for Modern Times in 1936. Uh, you also got to hear a little skit from Fanny Bryce as Baby Snooks. For those of you who don't know who Fanny Bryce was, if you've seen the movie Funny Girl with Barbara Streisand, that's the life story of Fanny Bryce. She was a big, big vaudeville performer. By the time of this show, she was no longer performing in vaudeville. She was an older lady, and she was doing the voice of a young girl, Baby Snooks, in these little comedy sketches, which appeared first on this Good News program, and then um, shortly thereafter, she got her own show, The Baby Snooks Show, and Fanny Bryce continued doing that character until she died in, I think, 1951 or so. So that's uh, some history of what's going on here. This is quite a historic broadcast. It gives you an insight into the promotion that was done for the film ahead of time. And they put a lot of effort and a lot of money into this one. And they knew they had a winner and they did. And of course, it's a well-loved film now by all generations since. So we're going to go back to part two of the Good News program and their special preview for The Wizard of Oz. This is Bob Young again, ladies and gentlemen, and we continue this season's final edition of our Maxwell House Good News of 1939. Now, good news goes to a party. We ask you to imagine yourselves on stage 30 of the Metro Goldwyn Mayer lot in the shadow of beautiful Emerald City, where scenes of The Wizard of Oz were made. Here in this beautiful setting, Judy Garland entertains our guests by singing her big song in the picture, Over the Rainbow. Judy? the rainbow 
sounds like a surefire hit, and you sang it beautifully. Thank you. Have I told you I think you're absolutely magnificent in the picture? Well, no, you haven't. All right, you are. What? Absolutely magnificent. Oh, thank you. Now, Judy, don't run away. We want you to sing some more later. But right now, I want everybody to meet two other members of the wizard cast. Bert Lauer, the cowardly lion, and Ray Bolger, the straw man. These two characters, along with Jack Haley, who plays the Tin Woodman, are Judy's companions on her trip through the land of Oz. And if we had Jack Haley here, we could present their song. We can do it without Haley, Bob. How? You sing Haley's part, and nobody will know the difference. I bet Haley will know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Jack's in New York and can't be with us, but if the cowardly lion and the straw man have no objections, I'll be glad to double in time. Let's have a whack at it, Meredith. First, Ray Bolger as the straw man. I could while away the hours Conferring with the flowers Consulting with the rain And my head I'd be scratching While my thoughts were busy hatching If I only had a brain I'd unravel every riddle For any individual In trouble or in pain With the thought you'd be thinking you could be another Lincoln if you only had a brain. Oh, I could tell you why the ocean's near the shore. I could think of things I never thought before. And then I'd sit and think some more. I would not be just a nothing, my head all full of stuffing, my heart all full of pain. And perhaps I deserve you and be even worthy of you if I only had a brain. Now Bob Young doubling for Jack Haley as a tin woodman. When a man's an empty kettle, he should be on his metal. And yet I'm torn apart Just because I'm presuming that I could be kind of human If I only had a heart I would register emotion, jealousy, devotion And really feel the part I would stay young and chipper And I'd lock it with a zipper If I only had a heart now, Bert Lauer is the cowardly lion. Gee, it's sad, believe me, Missy, when you're born to be a sissy without the women boy. But I could show my prowess, be a lion, not a mouse, if I only had the nerve. I'm afraid there's no denying I'm just a dandelion, a fate I don't deserve. I'd be brave as a blizzard I'd be gentle as a lizard I'd be clever as a gizzard If the wizard is a wizard who will serve Then I'm sure to get a brain A heart A home The nerve (laughs) Now ladies and gentlemen we have a special guest this evening at our party a man who has a special and unique reason for being at any celebration connected with the Wizard of Oz. Because 35 years ago, he and his famous partner were the stars of the original Broadway production of The Wizard. You've all heard of the team of Montgomery and Stone, and I know you'll join me in saluting Fred Stone here tonight. Fred, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you very much, Bob. Fred, there's one fellow here tonight you certainly ought to meet. And that's the man who plays your original part in the picture, the straw man. That's the role you created, isn't it? That's right, the straw man, Bob. Well, I want you to shake hands with Ray Bolger, the straw man in the picture. Ray, this is Fred Stone. (laughs) 
Fred Stone. Uh, oh, Mr. Stone, I've always considered you the greatest eccentric dancer that ever lived. Well, thank you, Ray. I sincerely consider you the finest eccentric dancer of the present time. In fact, I can truthfully say, you're the man I'd have chosen to play the part of the strong man myself. Oh, gosh, that, that means a lot coming from you. Well, we thought we had a grand production in The Wizard. Uh, it was pretty good, too, in 1904. Uh, it was, uh, of course, you know, in those days, in those days, yes, it was all right. 1904. Gosh, Mr. Stone, why, that was the year I was born. You don't say. Well, young man, I'm thrilled to meet you. Here, so many years later. No, I'm the one that's thrilled. I remember when you came to Boston at the Colonial Theater in your great show, uh, jack o Lantern, which, by the way, was the first show that I was ever allowed to see. And your wonderful performance on that show gave me my inspiration to be an actor, you know. <laughs> well, Ray, you've done a pretty good job for yourself. Gosh, I wish I could think of an answer, Mr. Stone. That's all right, son. The straw man ain't supposed to think. He never had a brain. <laughs> Say, am I supposed to take that as a compliment? Certainly, my boy. From now on, I'll always think of Ray Bulger as a straw man. Oh, thank you, sir. Goodbye. Well, Mr. Stone, I know just how you must yeah, feel it. Yeah, what's going this... on here? <laughs> oh, Frank, uh, this gentleman here was just comparing the Metro production of The Wizard with the original production on Broadway. Really? Well, I was great in the Broadway production, too. Did you see it, young man? <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> are, are you addressing me? Uh, that production was a notable triumph for me. We played for months and months, and every night the crowds used to cheer madly every time Frank. I went into my... What? You were in the original Broadway production of The Wizard? Well, of course, I was a star. And every night, beautiful girls used to hang around the stage door waiting to see me. Frank! When I came up, what? <laughs> let, him, let him go on, Bob. This thing. Yes, you're quite right, young man. <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> in those days, I used to save my notices, and the critic on the New York Globe said, Frank Morgan... Hey, now, wait in a the minute. What? Did you ever hear Fred Stone? I understand he was in The Wizard of Oz. Frank Stone? Fred Stone. Uh, Fred Stone, uh, oh yes, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, the boy came to me when the show was about to open and I made a dancer of him. I, uh, <laughs> I gave him a small part in the production and he made a, well, it was a very respectable showing. <laughs> Take it, Fred. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Uh, Frank Morgan, I'm Fred Stone. I starred in the original production of The Wizard with my partner, Dave Montgomery. And I don't, I don't remember you at all. That's uh, right, Frank. Stone and Montgomery were the stars of the show, and you were never with them. Uh, Stone and uh, Montgomery. Uh, <laughs> Stone, uh, Stone, Brick, uh, Boulder, Dam, Boulder, Dam, Pebble. Uh, rock, Rock, it all comes back to me now. I spent my time with Rock and Rye. Rock and Rye? Yeah. That was a great combination. Well, I'm glad to have met you, Mr. Rock. I've got to go to the... I'm, I'm... <laughs> That's all right, Mr. Morgan. I've got to go myself. Oh. Yeah, I, and I still think that you did a great job in The Wizard. <laughs> that's not static, folks. That's the old, old scarecrow. So long, boy. Oh, so long, God. Mr. Stone. Thank you. Say, Frank, this being the last program of the season, why don't yeah. you give the people a treat and tell the truth for five minutes? My dear boy, the Morgans have always lived sans peur et sans rapproche. Oh. <laughs> from my earliest infancy, I was taught the virtue of honesty, and from manhood on, I have employed only the truth. There's been a lot of unemployment lately. <laughs> yes. Young, Metro is taking you and me off the air. Is that the way to talk to a fellow <laughs> serf? Uh, <laughs> For centuries, the Morgans have been servants of the truth. In fact, I trace my ancestry back to Diogenes Morgan. That's on my mother's side. Yeah? yeah. What's on your father's side? Ananias. Who said that? <laughs> on my father's side, I trace now, my... Now, wait a minute, George Washington. Put away your hatchet for a second. Yeah? If you're so handy with the truth, why did you make up this outrageous lie that you played in The Wizard of Oz in 1904? Well, how did I know that Fred Stone... Was... I mean, anybody's... <laughs> Liable to make a mistake once in a while. As a matter of fact, it was a very curious mistake for me to make because it was in 1904 that I invented the, the motion picture camera. Oh, now we're going to get the truth. You've got the nerve to stand there and tell me you invented motion pictures, Mr. Morgan. Screen old Morgan, sir. <laughs> the last of a long line of brownies. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
uh, the inventor of the single sprocket, the double exposure, and the triple play. Unassisted. All right, make up your mind, Wizard. Are you lying about baseball or about pictures? About baseball. I mean pictures. <laughs> I mean, I'm not lying. Leave him alone, Bob. Say, uh, Frank, I'm a candid camera fiend. Oh, and I just... a fiend, huh? Yes. <laughs> I just bought one last Saturday at Snarley's Camera Shop there on South Fine. Uh-huh. It's a nifty little camera. The girl at the store was very helpful. She showed me all the ins and outs. Uh, she sold me the camera. Like her? Oh, she was all right, but you know how Peggy is a... Oh, you mean the camera. <laughs> no, <Getting ready>. uh, <laughs> it was a... Uh, <laughs> for next year. <laughs> Stealing my stuff. All right, go ahead. <laughs> oh, you mean the camera. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was a craft of flakes. 59 cents with two rolls of film. Oh, this is intolerable. I've got to go and lie down. Frank, I can't, please tell about the camera you invented. I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, it was in 1901 that I first conceived the idea that pictures could be made to move. 1901, huh? Yes. At that time, I was in business for myself as a general inventor occupying a back stoop at 112 Grumble Avenue of the Bronx. That's at the corner of Surly Street. Yes. Uh, is there any money in inventing, Frank? Is there? The fellow that invented Lifesavers made a mint. <laughs> It's the last program. You've got to expect those things. <laughs> First, I invented a spotless spot remover, and then Just I... Just a minute, Frank. Never mind your lesser achievements. Yeah. Let's hear how you invented motion pictures. Uh, motion. Yeah. Uh, what well, I, uh, while still a schoolboy, I mastered the chemistry of light emulsions and also became familiar with the peephole principle. In those days, I was known as Tom. <laughs> Okay, Tom. Yes, I constructed my first high-speed motion picture camera in 1902, a crude instrument compared with those in use today, but miraculous when you consider that I made it entirely from odds and ends, which I'd purchased at no expense from a junk shop. Hmm. Of course, I don't need to tell you, gentlemen, where that first Morgan camera reposes today. In the junk shop. Yes. It is not. <laughs> it's in the Smithsonian Institution. Good heavens, I'm getting like the cowardly lion. My camera worked like a charm. I was ready to shoot the first motion picture, but I was stumped. No one had invented film. You need that, don't you, Frank? Yes, it was up to me again. I knew that snapshot film was made with celluloid, but how was a poor inventor to come by 500 feet of it with which to make a motion picture? I racked my brains for days and finally hit the solution. You bought it from Eastman? No. <laughs> I made film out of celluloid collars. Frank. What kind of film can you make out of laundry? Technicolor? <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll hold you for a while. <laughs> well, how did you make it into film, Frank? Well, it was tremendously difficult. I worked in a dark room, coating each collar with emulsions, splicing them carefully, and piercing the sprocket holes by hand. In two days, I was ready to shoot the picture. You had uh, actors and everything, I suppose. All that, uh, that had been taken care of. Two weeks of shooting, and I was back in my dark room developing the first screen epic. Gee, when's the preview? Three nights later, I previewed it at the old Madison Square Garden in front of an audience of blue bloods, red bloods, and a uh, few anemics. Uh, <laughs> as soon as the lights went down, the picture hit the screen. What do you think? What? Well, the audience saw nothing but mushrooms. Mushrooms? Where did the mushrooms come from? Well, I forgot to take out the collar buttons. Well, so long, fellas. I'm going back to Baltimore. Warren Hull, what are you smiling about over there? Why, <laughs> Bob, you know, this is our last program until September, and I just got a mental picture of thousands of our friends in their homes late this evening poring over road maps, planning what routes they'll take to that wonderful two weeks vacation to the seashore or the mountains, riding, swimming, hunting, fishing. And you know, I'm reminded of a little scene that happened just a few weeks ago in the mountains. Two schoolmates of mine had been fishing and they came back to the campfire for their supper. Their wives were waiting. Listen. Hi, Jim. How many did you catch? Got a full basket? Yep, they're biting swell today, Pat. Marvelous trout. But boy, I'm tired. Say, have you got a cup of coffee ready? You bet I have, dear. Maxwell House. Just opened our third can today. And, Jim, that vacuum pack is wonderful. This last can of coffee's just as fresh as the first one we opened. You'll have a cup in a minute. And, friends, it's a wonderful feeling to know that even though you may be in the wilds of nowhere, you can still have your fresh, full-flavored cup of Maxwell House coffee any time you want it. Now, that's one of the comforts of home that you can take right along with you. 
For Maxwell House, packed in that famous blue super vacuum can, will always be roaster fresh, always have that full-bodied flavor that you love at home. You can stock up with two cans or two dozen in one pound or two pound sizes. No matter how long you're gone, the last can of coffee you open will be just as fresh and full-flavored as the first. So take along your Maxwell House for added pleasure. Make your vacation perfect. And if any of you folks, like many of us, are staying at home this summer, then you'll be thankful for the cool, refreshing pickup of a frosty glass of iced Maxwell House. So friends, ask your grocer for Maxwell House tomorrow, because iced or hot, we know you'll find this new, richer, smoother Maxwell House is just about the tops in coffee pleasure. <laughs> We're going to try a little experiment now, ladies and gentlemen. We want to present one of the production numbers from The Wizard of Oz, a song sequence greeting little Dorothy when she first arrived in the land of Oz. She's been whirled away from her home in Kansas by a tornado, house and all. And by a strange coincidence, her house lands right on top of a wicked witch in the land of Oz. So the people who live there are very glad to see her. Right after the crash, the natives, who are called munchkins, if you remember, peep shyly out from behind the shrubbery and begin to sing a welcome to Dorothy. Listen. Come out, come out, wherever you are, and meet the young lady who fell from the star. She brings you good news, oh heaven to her, when she fell on the canvas of miracle occurred. It really was no miracle, what happened was just this. The house began to pitch, the kitchen circus lich, and suddenly the hinges started to unhitch. Just then, the witch, to satisfy an itch, went flying on her broomstick, thumbing for a hitch. And oh, what happened then was rich. The house began to pitch, the kitchen circus lich, it landed on the wicked witch in the middle of a ditch. Which was not a healthy situation for the wicked witch. Began to quit and was reduced to death the stitch. But what was one of the wicked witch? Sing song, the wicked witch is dead. Witch, oh witch. Now, another of the sparkling songs from the Wizard production, Bert Lars' characterization of the Cowardly Lion. I, the king of the fathers, not queen, and not duke, not prince, my regal robes of the fathers, Satin, and not a cotton, and not chintz. <laughs> I'll command each thing, be it fish or fowl, with a woof, and a woof, and a royal growl. As I click my heel, all the trees would kneel, and the mountains bow, and the bulls cow cow. The sparrow would uh, take wings. <laughs> I, I was a king. <laughs> Each rabbit would show respect to me. The chipmunks genuflect to me. Though my tail would lash, I would show compass for every underling. 
of anything? Not nobody, not no how. Not even a rhinoceros? Imposterous. How about a hippopotamus? Why, I trash them from top to bottom. Supposing you met an elephant? I'd wrap him up in cellophant. What if it were a brontosaurus? And I'd show him who was king of the forest. How? How? Courage. What makes a king out of a slave? Courage. What makes the flag on the mast? away. Courage. What makes the elephant charge his tusk in the misty mist of the dusky dusk? What makes the muskrat guard his musk? Courage. What makes the sphinx the seventh wonder? Courage. What makes the dawn come up like thunder? Courage. <laughs> what makes the hot and tot so hot? What put the ape in apricot? What have they got that I ain't got? Courage. You can say that again. Huh? Huh? <laughs> oh, the courage is the thing of kings. Which courage I'd be king of kings. In the whole year round, I'd be held and crowned by every living That was The King of the Forest by Bert Lauer. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, the party wouldn't be complete unless all the guests take part in a get-together sing. Come on, everybody. Ray, Bert, Judy, you start us off, Frank Morgan. Ha, 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 and a ho, 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 and a couple of tra-la-las. This how we'll all for die away in the merry old land of us. Buzz, 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 chirp, 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 and a couple of la-dee-dahs. Then now the crickets crick all day in the merry old land of us. We get up at twelve and start to work at one. Take an hour for lunch. And then the two we're done. Oh, jolly good fun! Oh, ha, ha! Oh, ha, ha! Hey, a couple of tra-la-las. That's how we laugh the day away in the very old land of Oz. Judy? Somewhere over the rainbow Why can't I? Rainbow. If happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow, why, oh, why? Ray Bolger, I could while away the hours, conferring with the flowers, consulting with the rain, 
And perhaps I deserved you and be even worthy of you if I only had a brain. Bert Lauer? Gee, it's sad, believe me, Missy, when you're born to be a sissy without the women boys. But I could show my prowess, be a lion, not a mouse, if I only had the nerve. We're off to see the wizard, a wonderful wizard of Oz. Here he is, a wizard of Oz, it's ever a wizard of Oz. It's ever, ever a wizard of Oz, the wizard of Oz. Because, 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 because of the wonderful things he does. another good news season. Speaking for Metro Golden Mayor, we wish to extend our thanks and appreciation to the General Foods Corporation for the fine cooperation that has prevailed throughout the season. At this time, we also wish to publicly thank Sam Moore and Phil Rapp for the writing of these programs. Now, folks, I'll say good night. I'll be seeing you soon. In the meantime, go to the movies and take the family with you. Good night. And ladies and gentlemen, Here's a date to mark on your calendar. We'll be with you again next fall, starting Thursday evening, September 7th. Me too, Mr. Hall. You too, Snooks. And Daddy. Sure thing. Our Maxwell House gang just couldn't get along without you all. Whee! Goodbye, everybody. And friends, next fall marks the beginning of the eighth year of broadcasting for Maxwell House Coffee at the same familiar Thursday evening time. And it's been possible only because of your continued loyalty to Maxwell House Coffee. We want to thank you for that loyalty and for the many splendid letters of encouragement and appreciation you've sent us. We'd like you to know that it's the anticipation of your continued enjoyment of Maxwell House that's allowing us to meet again next September and that through the summer, you'll be enjoying iced Maxwell House. And Warren Hull saying good night and good luck for the makers of Maxwell House Coffee, the coffee that's always good to the last drop. See you in September. <laughs> Mervyn Leroy, Bobby Conley, and Marcella were impersonated. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Okay, there you have it. The uh, MGM Good News Program, the special preview two months before the release of the film The Wizard of Oz. Some quite historic stuff there and quite interesting for those who like the film lots of interesting background lots of everything and we'll be back again next week or we'll be back again thursday depending on when you want to listen we'll have uh, a the last of the top 10 horror shows on thursday and next week we'll be back with some more drama variety and comedy so until then this is john tefteller you've listened to the good old days of radio show uh, write us on facebook check out the website and we'll see you later thank you